Okay, welcome back to 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, and today our with is Amy Valentine. So, Amy, to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, and thanks for having me. Amy Valentine here. Um, I live in Colorado. I have dedicated my career to education since I was in grad school in Ohio back a, a while ago several years ago um, when I was a TA. So my entry point into education teaching was as a teacher's assistant in grad school. And I've held a lot of different positions since then, always wanting to find the best way to reach as many students as possible. And so I've served as teacher, administrator, um, executive director, teacher trainer, and now I run a national nonprofit called Future of School. We are a 501c3. We give scholarships to kids, grants to teachers, and we also publish impact reports, all centered around how technology and innovation in schools can really um, change the trajectory of the lives of students and empower teachers to embrace their entrepreneurial spirit. And so we've been doing that for several years, uh, four years in fact, and we're just really fortunate and lucky to be able to be an organization that honors and provides opportunities to digital pioneers, and also to creative educators. All right. Now, I know with Future of Schools, you've had the opportunity to work with a, a lot of teachers and um, on how to integrate technology into their classrooms and how to open up their classrooms beyond the bounds of its sort of four geographic walls. Um, we've got a lot of folks now that... Um, depending upon uh, what jurisdiction they're in. Some of them have probably at this point had a couple of weeks of remote teaching, a couple, you know, some folks may be in the four to six week range. Um, for folks that are relatively new to this, what sort of advice would you give them based upon the experiences you've had over the years? That's such a great question. And one of the things that's been really inspiring over the last month is hearing words of wisdom strategy shared um, ideas among practitioners who are new at it and also who have had experience doing it. So back in 2005, I was one of the first high school teachers that was hired to support the first online school in Colorado. And so um, I spent a lot of time with my colleagues developing, curating, cultivating, collaborating around best practices and connecting with students. And it's funny because last week I was talking to my old boss and we were reminiscing about those times, which seemed like forever ago. I mean, it was 15 years ago that we had the first full-time online school in Colorado. And she reminded me, she said, remember we would have our meetings and everybody, you know, everyone was trained in it and they still felt a certain degree of overwhelm. And she was right. It's, you know, teaching online, learning online, it, even with the best of training, it can be, it can feel like a lot because it's a departure from what we're used to. So the first thing I would tell teachers, and it's um, really for everybody, is um, what, what's happening right now, what's been happening in the last month that we're calling remote teaching and learning, it's not necessary, it's not indicative of what online learning is. Kids are learning online and teachers are teaching online, but online learning, it's been around for the last 20 years. And there's some schools and programs, some state-run schools, some part-time programs that have been developed that have all of the pieces in place, right? So it's it's a school or a program that's running online. What we've seen happen is shift to remote learning, which is what can I do to take this curriculum and connect with students online? So I almost think that where we're at right now is crisis schooling using online tools to be able to reach students and so that teachers can connect. So I would say to teachers, first and foremost, your job as a teacher and as a connector to students and with students is even more important now. Now that they're at home, now that they're, you know, we, we're, we have this happening at the same time that we have um, social distancing and in some states, stay at home orders that are mandatory. So, so students that, you know, they'll forever be hungry to connect with their, with their teachers and want to con connect with their peers as well. So I would say for teachers to, that, you know, that this is your time to shine, that, that, the, you know, the simpler you keep it, the better. Sometimes it's a phone call or an email that can really make the difference for students. And I know, it, you know, the feeling of overwhelm is a lot. It's a lot for everybody. So what, you know, my advice to teachers is what can you do to connect with students on a regular basis 
that really has everybody centered around the impact of the relationships. Because I believe that we're going to come out of this with teachers and administrators in schools being more tech savvy because they've been forced to. And that's not, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, in an ideal world, everybody can take a training course on it. Everybody could, you know, select different tools and resources that they want, but we're in a situation where it's it's mandatory and mandated and it can feel uncomfortable, but there's a lot of creativity and ingenuity that can come out of it. So for teachers, um, it's easy to feel like you're not doing enough. It's easy to feel lonely too. And that if we all constantly remind ourselves, especially our teachers, that we're doing the best that we can and we're reaching out to kids and we're providing different ways for them to engage in content, that there's huge power in that for transforming their classrooms when they come back to the brick and mortar schools. And also there's huge power in that for how they interact and engage with students without seeing them face to face every day. Okay. Um, now you mentioned your time back with the online school and I'm sure back then um, you noticed that the role of the family and the role of the parent in the educational context when you're learning at a distance was oftentimes very different than for those when you're in a face-to-face -face environment. And in much the same way, the teachers have been sort of thrown into this. We've got a whole whack of parents now that have been thrown into this remote learning situation and are starting to see their roles change as well. Um, what advice would you have for them? It's a great question. Um, similar to teachers, right? It, I think that there's a lot to be said about keeping it simple. But as far as families go and parents who are, who are new to this, right, they're not only new to being in their homes with their entire families, um, they're also new to their own employment circumstances. So maybe, you know, they might be part of a furlough, they might be part of a mandatory work from home, right? So there's a lot of different circumstances, I think, that play a role in a parent's ability to, you know, to the degree to which they can engage in the remote learning or the crisis schooling uh, medium. So I would say first and foremost to parents that it's about grace, right? It's, you know, your schools are figuring out how they can create these remote learning environments online and parents, you know, it's, it's easy. I can see it being easy for a parent to say, oh my gosh, I'm homeschooling my child. Oh my gosh, I'm my child's teacher. And one thing that's come up over and over is that I tell parents when I talk to them is, your role right now is to be a learning coach. And they're like, oh, that's kind of cool because it takes the pressure off of being a teacher. Um, you know, I am, a, I am a classically trained certified teacher in Spanish, K through 12, and I keep my license in K it, just because I love that. That's my heart and soul was, you know, of, of education was being a teacher. And I don't feel skilled or equipped to teach anything but Spanish to kids in grades, particularly high school, because I've never taught elementary school. So as a teacher, it's something that we take really seriously. And I feel like if a parent gives themselves that label, if they're like, okay, well, I'm homeschooling, I'm teaching my kid now, that feels like you have a lot more responsibility than giving yourself a, a title or a label like learning coach or a remote learning mentor, because then you're working in partnership with the teachers. Then it doesn't feel like, oh, I have to figure all this out, that administrators and teachers are going to great lengths to do that in states where um, technology or areas where technology is an issue, fringe rural, remote rural, where they just don't have the broadband access. You know, schools are setting up systems where parents can come through and pick up packets of content to take home and lead and guide their kids. Teachers are calling on their cell phones to be able to provide instruction and support to kids. So I would say, again, not to beat a dead horse, but consider yourself the learning coach. It takes a little bit of that pressure off right out of the gate. And um, also, I think it's important to recognize that our K-12 education system as a whole is, is evolving very, very quickly, right? It's like the, the evolution of it is happening at this upward trajectory, but the amount of time that we have as humans to become comfortable with it is, is short, it's small, it's a small amount of time. So um, we'll, we will all get there together. Um, and I, there's a couple other things that I have as recommendations too, um, that are a little bit more pragmatic and practical because I can sit here and say, you know, don't worry, it's going to be okay. You're the learning coach, you know, take the pressure off. But every day parents wake up and they, and they are challenged with figuring out how do they balance their child's education? 
How do they balance their responsibilities at home? And how do they balance, you know, some of the personal challenges around employment and maybe family members being sick and being concerned about who's going to go to the grocery store? So when it comes specifically to supporting your children in their remote learning environments or amidst this crisis schooling, the first thing I would say to parents is make yourself familiar with what, what is your school doing? There's going to be probably a lot of information from your school or district in a lot of different places, which can make you feel overwhelmed. Um, I would say don't be afraid to take notes, to print things out, to have it have the information at your fingertips, because sometimes as parents, you're going to be challenged to synthesize it down because a child who's in, you know, say middle school, who goes into Google Classroom, this could be their first time doing it. So it's creating an environment where you're learning together and you're accessing information. I would say if you have questions to reach out to the people at your school, um, you know, they're probably fielding a lot of different questions. I've recommended to several districts and schools that they create an FAQ list and put it on their website, send it out every week. Here's the five most frequently asked questions this week that parents can access because next week, the parents who maybe are, you know, their kids are a little behind or they haven't gotten there yet, they're going to have those questions. So, um, uh, and I would say if you feel overwhelmed, just to step back, take a minute, walk away, step away from it. Um, you know, there's, there, it's like that old analogy, uh, you know, a crying baby. If you put a crying baby in a crib, you know, no baby ever, you know, suffered fatally from crying. It's okay to step away from a moment like that to come back with more patience. Um, one thing that I've heard that works really, really well for parents is to create your own schedule for your kids. So every school is, you know, schools are doing something different across the board. Maybe within district schools are doing similar things. So it depends on what your school is doing. Maybe they have live sessions. Maybe they have optional office hours. But where you can create a schedule is around chunking, chunking your time. So, you know, maybe, you know, and I would also say schooling remotely is not seven or eight hours. That's it's a too many hours. I think there's a misnomer that, okay, well, my child went to school six or seven hours, eight hours a day. They had lunch, they had recess. So they should be schooling like five or six hours. It's not, it's, it's a different environment and it's a different kind of intensity. So I would say two hours in the morning, you know, two to three hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, but breaking it up and then giving your child choice whenever possible. Um, kids are at home right now and they have very limited power in the, you know, and what they do with their time and where they go. So whether it's, um, you know, choice for what they eat for lunch, choice in printing worksheets out and having them do that that way, choice in what time they're doing their schooling, have them par uh, partner with you in creating that schedule, just loose schedule. A loose schedule is so much better for kids than, than no schedule or a strict schedule. Um, and so I think it's increasingly important to find ways to embrace the voice of kids in this process. And, and you'll learn. I mean, they might say, I really like my live sessions with my teachers, or they might say, I really appreciate when you sit down and, and go through this basic algebra with me, or they may say, they may say, I don't like any of it. And they may say, I love all of it. So this gives kids an opportunity to learn in different ways. Um, like I said, stay connected with your school, stay connected with your teachers. I'd also recommend anything that you that teachers are doing that you want to recognize and celebrate. I highly recommend that. One thing we're doing at Future of School is the Teacher of the Week Award. It's, it's seemingly small, but we're giving a small group of teachers every week um, $150 that they can use for their remote learning environment. Maybe it's to have, uh, you know, have dinner or delivered a few nights. Maybe they need a, a printer, but it's really to alleviate the pressure on teachers and also give, give educators a chance to nominate each other. And so that's what we're doing as an organization. As a parent, it doesn't take anything more than a, a one minute email or take a picture of your kid learning, you know, doing their assignment and send it to the teacher. They, they miss that too. And they're hungry for that. So I, I would just end by saying, don't, you know, I would say don't overlook opportunities, however, seemingly small to recognize and honor um, the amazing things that are being done right now. 
because they're happening every day and they're keeping kids engaged. And we're going to see that through, you know, through the rest of this year and beyond. So I would say stay patient, reach out to us. We're here. We have a growing network of parents, teachers, and leaders who are all here to help support kids. And um, I'm just really lucky to have the opportunity to speak to all of you. And thank you, Michael, for the opportunity. Oh, not a problem. And we'll make sure we've got the link below to both the Future of School organization as well as the Teacher of the Week uh, feature that we've got there so that folks will be able to get into it easy. So thank you, Amy. This has been another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning today with Amy Valentine. Thank you. Bye.